All right. Uh, hello, Sublation Media viewers and readers. It's me again, Douglas Lane. And today I have two of the most prominent Hegelian philosophers in the world with me, at least in the English language, uh, even if English isn't always their native tongue. Slavoj Žižek is the author of Less Than Nothing, The Sublime Object of Ideology, The Parallax View, and many, many other books. And Terry Pinkard is the author of Hegel, A Biography, Hegel's Naturalism, Does History Make Sense?, and uh, Hegel's Dialectic, an Explanation of Possibility. He also recently retranslated Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit for Cambridge University Press. Today, Pinkard and Zizek are going to talk to me and to each other about how to understand Hegel and what he might mean for us today. Before we get started, though, there's some business I want to go through here. I want to remind viewers that you can support us on Patreon, viewers who enjoy this conversation might want to sign up because patrons will get access to a second conversation on this topic. Derek Varn has agreed to stop by for a debrief later this afternoon. So at 4 p.m. Pacific time, we'll be live streaming a response to what comes out of this conversation you're about to hear. Go to patreon.com backslash diet soap to sign up. Also, if you're excited by what you find on this channel uh, you, or what you read in our magazine, or if you're just interested in talking to other socialists, we are starting meetups around the country. Meetups are right now set in Chicago, Miami, San Diego, and in Brooklyn. Uh, Chicago, Miami, and San Diego, those are on Friday. The, there's one in Brooklyn on Saturday. If you want to go or if you just want to start a meetup in your own city, shoot our guy Clint an email. That's clintm at sublationmedia.com. Clint is an admin at Sublation, and he'll let you know where the meetings are being held. Right now, we are also hosting a watch party on our Discord. If you want to talk to other uh socialists and fans of sublation people who maybe hate us go to the discord uh there's a link to it in the description for this video um so we're just about to begin and uh when we come back out of this uh introduction slavoy and terry will be on screen as well the death of god is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. All right, so here we are with Terry Pinkard and Slavoj Zizek to discuss Hegel. Thank you both for coming on to the Diet Soap podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you both, and I'll, I'll start with you, Terry. Um, who was Hegel, and why should people on the left people who are interested in socialism and uh, fundamentally changing society be interested in Hegel? Well, uh, who was Hegel? Uh, Hegel was not gonna, a European phenomenon. Uh, Hegel was, in some ways, people have said Hegel was the la actually the last guy to know everything here. Uh, but more importantly, I think, is, you know, when you say who was Hegel's, kind of what has happened with Hegel as a figure, the in, almost the entire 20th century of philosophy is basically organized around a negation of Hegel. I mean, analytic philosophy begins with the rejection of Hegel. You have to be an anti-Hegelian to do this. Uh, the European tradition rejected Hegel as a proto-totalitarian among all others, right? So the entire one, you know, last century that we had defined itself philosophically against Hegel. Now, of course, part of that was also defining itself, at least in certain circles, right? It's against Marx too. Um, and that the relation between Hegel and Marx, of course, has become very important. So one of the one of the issues about Hegel is, should we really be negating Hegel? Right? I mean, this is a person who left his stamp on now almost two centuries of social thinking. And Slovoy, you can get to go. Uh, first, nonetheless, an introductory note: why I am so proud to be here with. Terry, I hope he will agree that we have two types of people who study and write about Hegel. Either over-specialists, you know, 
you can see they read it all, but they don't produce anything in their interpretation really breathtaking. Then we have uh, radical readings who may be interesting, but are so one-sided, like the big example, Alexander Kozhev. It's all based about, it all turns around one section of phenomenology of spirit. And correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, but you are practically the only guy I know who can sit in good sense on both caps, who has this expanded knowledge of Hegel, but at the same time, it's not just <laughs> this flat reporting of how much you know. Okay, I, Terry already gave some basics very briefly why Hegel today. First, I would say that uh, philosophy in the last decades, but now we are coming on out of that, something very sad was happening in philosophy. On the one hand, what we in old-fashioned way called ontology, not in the correct sense, but simply, there is reality out there, we have to know it, does it have an end, beginning, free will, blah, blah. This was de facto left to scientists. Today, it's a crazy paradox. If you want to know, does a universe have an end and the beginning, you don't ask philosophers, you ask quantum cosmologists. If you want to know, do we have a free will? That's, I don't agree with this, but that's the predominant opinion. You ask, uh, you ask uh, uh, cognitivist brain, brain scientists. On the other hand, we had what I, with all the irony, call uh, uh, discourse, postmodern historicist discourse analysis, where ultimately they don't even approach this. They dismiss them as naive ontological questions, all amount to, uh, 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 to within which discourse a certain question moves. For example, if one were to ask Michel Foucault, do we have a free soul? His answer would have been, do you know that the question you're raising now is only possible within a certain horizon of meaning and so on and so on. Now, there are good signs that we are overcoming this duality. And here I see the role of Hegel. Second thing, uh, in a friendly step at Robert Brandom, the title of his book, Spirit of Distrust, eh, I already made what I wanted to say, uh, my point. Spirit of Trust, I think the greatness of Hegel is precisely in what I called in a text, spirit of distrust. Hegel is, I think, at his strongest, where he takes some well-planned, well-meaning project idea and see how necessarily it turns wrong. So I think that the uh, end of 19th century, 20th century, would have been a wonderful time for Hegel, if he were magically to survive, to do his analysis. He did it apropos French Revolution. All the best intention, uh, you end in, uh, 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 in uh, uh, revolutionary terror. Then Hegel would have been delighted. Uh, second half of 19th century, at least in Europe, uh, uh, long period of peace, beginnings of feminism, health care, retirement plans, up you get World War I. You get October Revolution, oh, you get uh, Stalinism. And the last example, Fukuyama thought, the end of history, haha, you get 9-11, you get where we are now. Here, Hegel would have been like fish swimming in water. That's what fascinates, that's what fascinates me in Hegel. Just the last one, then I leave all the time to Terry. Uh, Terry, and it's my first question to you, how do you stand to this? Many Hegelians today are what I ironically call not yet their Hegelians. They claim that Hegel had a certain idea of uh, 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 the best possible state, freedom, blah, blah, but he put it in a wrong way, too idealist. First, we have, of course, Marx, or exemplarily the young Lukács, 
he openly says in his history and class consciousness that uh, uh, absolute spirit should be replaced by proletariat, proletariat revolutionary force as the first subject object of history. Then, just to jump ahead, we have, of course, uh, we have Fukuyama. Hegel was just wrong. It's today parliamentary democratic capitalism. And then we have, you know, there are some madmen, some of these new age believers in singularity, shared awareness, who said, no, only here Hegel's dream becomes true. I flatly reject this vision. And again, although I appreciate him highly, Hegel's, uh, sorry, Brandon's idea of some third stage in the future, which is already implicit in Hegel, I disagree with this. Hegel, precisely because he is extremely open towards the future, Hegel always warns about making plans, uh, projections about the future. Sorry to ask to look. Um, sorry. So, Terry, it seems to me that Silvoy answered the, the question I was going to ask next, which is what is at stake when we attempt to interpret Hegel today? Um, and I, uh, in, a, in a sense, he did. And I, I think I want to give you an opportunity to, to answer Silvoy and then maybe take a stab at that question. So what, why, why should we read Hegel today? What is at stake today? Well, as I said, I mean, one of the things that's at stake with Hegel is the fact that so much of the of this last century – consisted in denying Hegel. Uh, you know, so Hegel be, became this kind of you know, strange, shadowy figure, right, who had to be denied. Uh, so the way I think put it very rightly, you know, there's some people who want to say, lots of people actually, uh, Hegel was very bright. Hegel got this almost right, but he put it wrong. Yeah. Know, <laughs> we have to retranslate it so that it comes out sounding like something I would want or something like that. So one of the great things about Hegel is that Hegel, Hegel is he's hard to read he's made himself deliberately hard to read um, and he is always challenging everything that's coming along that's why he says you know half jokingly right that in the preface to the phenomenology that when you start looking at how he handled all these things it looks like he's trying to cast doubt on everything and this becomes really the path of despair this spiteful to fret spiteful here but in fact there is you know something about coming to an idea of what the power of the negative in this particular case is the fact that all these kind of claims to absoluteness and so on have had their own undoing. So one of the other things is that, you know, there's this idea that Hegel has, which I think is really crucial, this idea of, of sublation, uh, as your media company is called here, mm -hmm. this alpha mm -hmm. right, where, as I put it, in many ways, what happens when Hegel looks back over, let's say, his uh, various historical processes, it's not way I think brought this up, right? It, you know, is that they don't turn out like they were supposed to turn out here. Everybody has the best intentions. We got all the, you know, the best minds that work on this and so on. And then it turns into something opposite here. And when that happens, things begin to fall apart. They begin to crumble. And the people living in the ruins of that collapsing order have to figure out what parts work and what parts don't, throw out the parts that don't work, grab the parts that do, and then they build a new way of life. And at that point, they didn't tell, they didn't tell themselves, now we, we have finally figured it out. It's the end of history. Everything's in order, right? We can all, re we can all relax now. Uh, but that turns out never to be the case here, especially with Hegel. And so one of, the, I mean, one of the features that is, I think, really crucial is that Hegel is a grand metaphysician. He's a superb logician. He's a superb epistemologist. He holds his own in the most abstruse and abstract ways in philosophy. But the one thing that's really striking about Hegel uh, is that he combines the abstract and the concrete in ways that nobody really has since mastered. You know, Heidegger does this, Sartre does it, and so on. Lots of contemporary philosophy is very good at the abstract stuff, you know, with all these different counterfactual reasonings and so on. Hegel runs both hot and cold at the same time. He's describing things in what look like, you know, very abstract logical terminology. At the same time, he's right on the ground with how people are experiencing things, what it's like for them to be going through this and so on, what it's like to be inside this kind of form of life as it is in fact starting to unravel on itself and what it's like to be that kind of person. Well, so far, I think that what I've heard from both of you is a lot of agreement about the significance of Hegel, but um, this was sort of advertised as not quite a debate, but a, maybe a conversation around a disagreement. 
And uh, I kind of want to start getting to that. The, there are some questions that I wrote uh, to, and sent to you both about materialism and idealism. Um, and what I want to ask is, uh, starting with you, Terry, um, what would you describe as, what, how would you think of matter as a concept? Or put differently, what does it mean to be a materialist in outlook? And then I, I, I think you would say Hegel is an idealist and that you side with him on that level. So um, what what kind of idealism does Hegel advocate or, or uh, arrive at? And uh, how and why do you uh, side with him over Marx and Marx's materialism, which I think a lot of people on the left right now want to return to? Okay, this is a, a great question. I hope we can you know tease this out here some more. The... Yeah. Um, when Hegel, I say Hegel's an idealist and not a materialist. I think another way to look at it is Hegel is an idealist, but not a kind of 20th, 21st century naturalist. That is, Hegel doesn't think that, in fact, cognitive science and you know, brain scans and so on are going to answer our questions about, for example, how the economy should be structured here. These are questions of meaning, consequence, and so on. And Hegel is Hegel doesn't think that there's going to be an easy answer to be found in some laboratory somewhere answer those things. These are questions about human projects, what we're committing ourselves to, what we can commit ourselves to, what we can't, what's now, what is now dead and what's still living and all these things. Um, but there's another way. I mean, Hegel is, uh, he claims to be an idealist, but of course he also is very interested in say material conditions of things and his philosophy of history, for example, he brings out the examples of gunpowder, of the printing press and of clocks here as the ways in which history was moving forward. Right? These are very material things. Gunpowder means that the old aristocratic ethos of outfitting yourself with a huge suit of armor, which only you can pay for, is now irrelevant, thus undermining the aristocratic ethos itself. Clocks are going to change the way work is going to be done. People are not going to be working wage labor according to the clock and so on. Uh, and uh, Likewise, the printing press, for obvious reasons, is going to change the way things are going to be going on. So it's not the case that Hegel claims that, say, as he's often portrayed, I think, wrongly, as saying that the only thing that matters is whether people change their minds or the ideas that are going on in their head and so on. Uh, the other thing is that Hegel is, of course, a firm opponent of all these kinds of traditional metaphysical dualisms. You might say there's materialism versus idealism, and he would say, well, actually, no. The correct form of idealism, as he says, is in fact already a form of materialism. So what's, his, what's the example that he gives over and over again, right? When he says, what is the truth of idealism? He says, well, the animals are the ultimate idealists, right? They don't treat things as if they had this, you know, kind of you know, great reality on their own. They just jump on them and eat them. Now, this is not an idealism that claims that everything exists in your own head and so on. The, animal, the animals have a practical relation this kind of thing. They see things in terms of their projects. They want to understand what the, the animal wants to understand also in some ways, what the way the world works. It wants to know what's going to eat him, what kinds of things can, and can the animal eat. So the distinction between materialism and idealism is going to be one that Hegel's going to say you can't draw a firm line around. Although he says, I am an idealist, idealist in the same sense in which, well, the animals are idealists. I have a certain kind of practical relation to reality. That practical relation also requires a theoretical relation. We have to understand what it is that we're doing. We are, after all, self-conscious beings. We're not just pursuing goals. We are taking our goals and pursuits as these goals. Hegel says in the encyclopedia, the difference between us, the only the, the real difference between us and the animals is animals have purposes, just like we do. But we have purposes as purposes. We entertain them in that kind of way. And that way we have political projects, which say the animals will not have in this case. So I think that there's a, one of the features of Hegel is that he is in fact, in fact, trying to overcome the materialism idealism or the naturalism idealism kind of dichotomy here with a much more nuanced view about what it means to be a self-conscious life you know, that's thrown into the world, absorbed in its present assignments and context and projecting itself onto a future where it knows it will not be. It don't, it will confront the ultimate master, ultimately, right? death. So Hegel has got a very anchored view. It's a kind of naturalist view. It has an element of purposiveness in it. You have to understand life as purposive. 
in this particular case, not as designed by anybody, but as internally purposive. This was the great, uh, he thinks, uh, contribution that Kant made to all this and so on. And given now that we have this idea about everything being in, you know, this kind of our, set in this world of meaning that we've created and that we can also now change, right, in this case. So why do I, what, is, what do I understand about Hegel's uh, idea of matter and so on? It's that, of course, we're material beings, but we're not just any old kind of material being. We're a very peculiar one. We are, we are alive and we are conscious of being alive. We are self-conscious so that we're entertaining various views of ourselves and so on. I mean, you know, I think self-consciousness is really crucial to all of this and so on. But I'll, let me just stop there and uh, go over to Savoy. Savoy, um, you have been describing yourself as a materialist lately. Um, do you take issue with uh, Terry's uh, position on idealism? And, and uh, why have you been working on rediscovering or reimagining ma materialism? I, mean, I like to provoke people. That's why I also call myself often dialectical materialist, well knowing that what existed as dialectical materialism is, one cannot put it in another way, uh, uh, intellectual stupidity embodied, common sense. So uh, it will look back, ba it looks back, Doug, for your plan to create a conflict here between the two of us, you will not. Because, you know, uh, for me, I'm not a materialist in this naive 19th century sense, even not 20th century. 20th century version is uh, brain sciences will tell us the truth and so on. But the ultimate 19th century form was what really exists is empty space and some small bits of matter which then run into each other and everything develops uh, out of that. Now comes a more philosophical part in what sense I see in Kegel what uh, I am tempted to call the materialist element. It's absolutely not this idea that you cannot uh, uh, sublate Aufhebung. You cannot do everything that something resists. No. Uh, I think this is Hegel's speculation at its greatest, at least for me, that the very movement of sublation, idealization of the all that exists in an immediate forum, has to finish in a new moment of immediacy in which this very circle of sublation is again embodied. This is why, to the horror of all my friends, and I wonder your reaction to this, Terry, I was always fascinated and repeatedly dealt with Hegel's deduction of the monarch. He's saying something wonderful there. State, dialectical mediation, we all uh, uh, become what become through our work what we are, and so on, in almost Sartrean way, no? Uh, 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 a subject is something that he, he, he makes oneself out of it. But then on the top, you have, as Hegel says, with full irony, we have somebody whose determination is purely contingent biological, and whose function is not to really decide, but to just formally decide signing documents prepared by proper specialists. I think that even politically, there is a deep insight here, which is there must be a gap between the top of political power and managers, specialists, those who qualify for their special knowledge and so on and so on. And so as my friend Frank Ruda pointed out here, the final moment of a long process of Aufhebung is always what he calls in German Aufgeben, to let the other go freely. It's a deep necessity, not some stupid speculation that logic, when it closes its circle, has to release itself, as it were, into nature. So this is, I think, again, the true speculative moment that 
the circle of sublation, gradual mediation has to be re-embodied again in a moment of immediacy. As to go he to Hegel and Marx, I hope you will like my answer, is that in some sense, truly idealist speculative sense, sorry to tell you this, Hegel was more materialist than Marx. You know in what sense? I always celebrate the introduction, I think towards the end, no introduction, for Rede, I think, to Rex philosophy, to Hegel's philosophy of right, where he has those famous lines about, you know, the all of Minerva takes only in the evening. All that thinking can do is provide the notional form of a way of life Historic, historical, oh my God, what Friday, <laughs> historical epoch, which is already coming to its end. And I think, I think Robert Pippin, here I agree with him, noted this, that surely Hegel was not an idiot who didn't notice that this must hold also for the social system he describes in his philosophy of right. He is not describing there an ideal future society. While, and he again says that future, we have to leave it open. Uh, 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 why is this so important? Because Marx, the way I read him, had uh, a much stronger element of teleology which goes also into the future. In spite of all historical relativization, Marx's point is that there is inscribed into the present situation, if not a necessity, at least what Lukacs would have called an objective possibility to bring a new, more emancipated way of life and so on and so on. And again, Hegel would have here predicted Stalinism, to put it in vulgar terms. Hegel would have always said, OK, OK, but what are the options there that things go wrong? So to return to this, I think that uh, that uh, uh, Hegel would have never agreed to this teleology inscribed into the future, which also clearly signals that Hegel was not a, an absolute idealist in the stupid sense of uh, I know everything or what. My God, he... He ends his philosophy or uh, history at, at the beginning says, no, future is off. Teleology is in some sense always retroactive. Uh, what Hegel would have appreciated in Marx, and this is, I think, the greatest Marx, is that at some point, for historical reasons, Marx was more Hegelian than Hegel. In what sense? Hegel's uh, notion of economic exchange productivity is still that of, uh, let's say, artisanal market production. Mar uh, Hegel didn't yet really confront capitalism. Marx did, and that's the wonder of Marx for me, described, uh, discovered there a Hegelian process. If you read Capital, the whole passage from uh, Money to capital is a Hegelian process where money as neutral universality subjectivizes itself, becomes its own uh, uh, agent, and so on and so on. But uh, again, I hear a Hegelian. I think what we need today, I say this with all brutal irony, is a Hegelian materialist reversal of Marx. Let's get rid of all that teleology, let's become more uh, realist. Uh, uh, and uh, just to conclude, two points I loved by Terry. First, when you said all post, all 19th, 20th century philosophy against Hegel, would you agree, Terry, that this is the third time that this happened? First, as Michel Foucault said, okay, although I am not a Foucauldian, I don't like him especially, that philosophy can be defined, defined as uh, uh, as critique reversals of Plato. No, <laughs> all things uh, you have immediately Aristotle, Stoics, and so on and so on. Then in modern age, everybody wants to be anti Cartesian. 
either in a Spinozian way, in an empiricist way or so either. But again, 19th century, it's, uh, it's Hegel. But as you, Terry, demonstrated so nicely, it's very interesting and crucial to understand not so much Hegel as our history, to see how this resistance to Hegel created, I have here, I will not read it, a wonderful quote from you, where you said how Hegel is one of those think, thinkers, just about all educated, they know, and then that, they think, and then you enumerate all bad things. Hegel was an idealist in the sense that he thought reality was ultimately spiritual, he thought the state was, uh, uh, was uh, God's work, and so on, all that stuff, and this should give us to think, why this crazy, factually as wrong as it can be, he the image of Hegel predominates, predominates even now. Just the last remark, Terry, what you said about, uh, about uh, uh, this uh, 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 idealism as self, I would say self-consciousness or rather self-reflexivity. For me, the basic insight of idealism, and here I agree with you, Terry, that life as such is an idealist phenomenon. It is that you, as a living being, you are never simply part of your environment. The way you relate to an otherness is always mediated by a minimum of self-relating. You retroactively determine how do you relate to otherness, what in that otherness is uh, interesting for you. Um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Almost I'm tempted to refer here <coughs> to that wonderful claim, often heard phrase in film noir, that femme fatale there is uh, somebody you hate to love. You <laughs> love her, but it's reflexivity. You hate yourself to love her. Or, on the opposite, a good bad guy is a bad guy whom you love to hate. You know, it's just one. This, it, this is just a minor example. But what I'm saying is that this, this is for Hegel, we can go later into it, absolute idealism. It's not absolute in the sense that we go beyond all appearances, there is some absolute beyond. Absolute means neither objective nor subjective, but an objectivity which includes even a deceptive, illusory self-relationship. That's what Hegel means with absolute. No, not, oh, I know absolutely everything and so on and so on. And that's what up, uh, as some intelligent commentators pointed out, absolute idealism is maybe, as Hegel makes it clear in the already quoted part of the uh, 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 preface to Rex philosophy, Hegel is maybe one of the most radically historical, not historicist thinkers. Hegel is well aware that Flat historicism is an extremely arrogant position. You are out the process and simply see different phases and so on and so on. Hegel has here a wonderful distinction between Zweifel, simple doubt about external things, and Verzweiflung, real existential despair. And in this sense, I don't have to develop it now, Hegel's absolute idealism is even, I would say, a form of radical limitation, that you accept that you are caught in certain closure. It's not, I know everything, I'm outside. Sorry if I was too long. Please. That's okay. So um, I think we're beginning to get to the disagreement um, or we're kind of circling around the disagreement between your two interpretations of Hegel, or at least I'm hoping we can get to it. You. Who, Putin, part. Russian spies to trying to... You know, Terry, what I propose you, sorry. He said we need an enemy. What if in the fascist way they put antagonism onto Jew, 
we loud and proclaim Doc is the enemy. Well, look, I am like I'm a Marxist. I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm your enemy for both of you two. But um, uh, I I, I want to get to the stakes of this, and um, because I want to remind you both and the people watching that what this is about is understanding how Hegel offers us an opportunity to be free, to have a society which is more free, to have relations with each other that are free, uh, to understand what freedom is. And I think that I, I think Hegel that's is a philosopher. His first question is here, what do you mean now by freedom? <laughs> well, right. Well, no, I'm going to, you guys have to work that out. But um, uh, 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 Terry, My um, God, you know, with what pleasure when we the people take over, you will be sent to re education. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure I will. And look, you guys will have to line up to figure out which one of you gives the order because uh, there's so many people who want to send me there. Um, but uh, in a lecture you gave, Terry, uh, entitled From Hegel to Marx, What Went Wrong, you described Hegel's solution to the problem of freedom and determinism. Uh, Hegel suggests that a reciprocal relationship between the causal level of reality and our self-reflective understanding uh, defines freedom and uh, the causal world or nature acts upon our self-consciousness and then our understanding or second nature can shape the causal order. Um, what I want to ask you uh, to start the, the, the beginnings of a disagreement, which will hopefully shift away from me and be between the two of you, is uh, could this reciprocal relationship obtain if nature was complete, um, or does it require that nature itself is incomplete, constituted by a gap, and negative? Um, yeah, there's a lot you need to unpack there. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, let, me, let me just point out, by the way, this uh, lecture that was called From Hegel to Marx, What Went Wrong, is not the title I gave to the lecture. That was a lecture I gave in Romania, I showed up and they had a big placard outside that said, Terry Pinker's talking about from Hegel to Marx, what went wrong? And I <laughs> the lecture I was not talking about that, but mm -hmm. that's a different, that, that's, that's a different issue. Here. Yeah. Um, look, one of the things I think that um, uh, is, I, I think Slavoj did a good job on this, but basically he Hegel in the beginning of the philosophy of right says philosophy is its own time grasped in thoughts. Mm -hmm. right? We cannot control the future. In that respect, now there's, Hegel is different from a certain type of materialist Marxist, kind of an old-fashioned Plekhanovian Marxist, you know, who thinks yeah. there are these great social forces. They operate independently of us, right? So on, at one point, you know, Plekhanov says, and, you know, Sartre just loves making fun of this. Um, Plekhanov says it really wouldn't have mattered if Napoleon had died at one of those battles, right, early battles. Somebody else would have become Napoleon, right? It was one of the other general... Everything would have worked out and Waterloo still would have occurred, so on, so on, right? Of course, that's I mean, it's not true. And Hale would have known that's not true, uh, but that there are certain types of places where individuals are going to make a big difference or this particular technology is going to make a big difference and so on, so on here. So when Hegel is talking about not, you know, when, he, when we want to distinguish Hegel from what's called vulgar Marxism or vulgar materialism, mm -hmm. There's a view that we don't really, there's not much we can do. We just have to let history decide and you know, wait around for it to happen. Hegel, that's definitely not Hegel's position. Now, there is a, a disputed, disputable point here, and I think it has, it links Hegel and Marx. That is, Marx, at least early on, Marx is very much taken with the idea of revolution modeled on something like the French Revolution. There's suddenly, there's an uprising. People stand up, right? There's an immediate collapse and the old order is gone. Yeah. Now, Hegel believed in all these revolutionary um, breaks in history, no question, but he didn't think that the French Revolution in that sense, right, was the paradigm case. In fact, what happens is he makes it very clear when he discusses the French Revolution is that the new order has to grow up in the heart of the old order. This is something Marx later took over. Right. And sometimes the collapse is going to come like it did in Paris in 1789 all at once. And sometimes it's just going to kind of grow until things have changed so much that people don't really remember what it was like beforehand and so on. Uh, for a socialist, if you're looking at the way Hegel looks at things, right, you could say what you have to start doing is building, building the blocks of a future socialist order within the current capitalist order. Uh, you have to, you know, move in this direction. You you try. You look for the weaknesses and so on. 
And what you're hoping for is at least one day people will just wake up and say, you know, this the capitalist version of this is, isn't working, right? We've already got all these other institutions. We've got you now pension schemes. We've got universal health care. We're going to cut the military, you know, this and that. And so we're going to engage in more cooperative international relations rather than these attempts by the U.S. to impose its hegemony on everybody. So there's a view of this, right, that where you might say there's a way in which Hegel disagrees with a certain type of Marxist eschatology, you know, that it all happens at once. Christianity took over, but it didn't take over all at once. It had to grow up in the heart of the ancient Roman pagan republic. It had to survive into the empire. Uh, it had to, you know, then, you know, kind of get itself in order through a whole period of feudalism, right? So roughly a, a thousand years where Hegel says, right, wrong was right when Rish Baudelaire and so on. There was just no law really going on. Now, I think Marx actually changed his mind about this as he got older, as, as he came to see that capitalism wasn't going to, I mean, this is a tendentious reading of Marx, roughly after the 18, late 1850s, early 1860s, mm -hmm. Marx began to focus on what he thought was just the ongoing crisis, crises of capitalism. One of the features of capitalism is not that it develops itself all to a point and then collapses, right? But rather that it just continually reiterates itself in terms of crises. You know, so 2008 is going to come around again, right? It's going to, who knows when, right? But you have the Great Depression, you have 2008, you have all the other recessions, you have this, you have that. And that's inherent in the nature of the capitalist system, that it is crisis prone, falls apart, and then writes itself generally in a fairly... Uh, violent way we kind of got off in 2008 right with only the you know the basically the banks just sat, siphoning off everything to themselves and so on and letting things go on as they were before here so that's a view about what you take to be looking at the future and so on when Hegel says his own time grasped in thoughts he doesn't mean he's giving a snapshot say of a particular period mm -hmm. it's rather you want to see where you are and what the what the possibilities are Right. And so Hegel's looking around at, the, say, 1820 when he's looking at this. Some of the possibilities are that you just wind the clock back, as the French had tried to do after 1815. Another possibility might just be kind of complete, you know, falling apart of everything. Another possibility might be that simply the large capitalists are going to take over here. Uh, it is. Here's just a little historical aside. In 1820, Hegel taught that Hegel, on the whole, doesn't use the term class. But in 1824, the Brockhaus Encyclopedia published an article on Hegel by a guy named Vint at Leipzig, who was actually an acquaintance of Hegel and it had features of Hegel's life that people, nobody but Hegel would have known about, indicating that Hegel was overseeing this article. And it says, at the end of the article, it says, Hegel has been accused of being an apologist you know, for the Prussian state. Um, but his, in his own philosophy, he has never, never in any way intended for his philosophy to be a means of upholding Hessian de Klasse, the ruling class. Here. That's striking. That's in 1824. That's when he's alive. That's when he, if he really disagreed with that, he could have just stepped out and said, I, you know, that's not me, right? You know, uh, so on. There's some other things we could talk about. I mean, one of the other possibilities that's mentioned in the philosophy of right, almost in passing, is this comes back to Slavoj's view of the deduction of the monarch. Uh, at the same time that Hegel is talking about the deduction of the monarch as this kind of figurehead who signs things and then stands up by the castle wall and waves and so on at us, uh, is that his friend Edward Gans, who was lecturing on the philosophy of right uh, and so on, and Hegel approved of all this. He, Gans was probably Hegel's closest friend at that point. Gans was saying, actually, you don't need a monarch. You can have, you know, the North Americans are showing you can have a president, you can have this and that. Um, so Hegel's aware that these, that his his best friend, his best friend and most insightful pupil is also not included in a monarch. And I think that's interesting that Hegel is now opting for, as he thinks, that among all the options available, something like the English version, right, of a constitutional monarch is, you know, with it's really just a figurehead of sorts, might be the only, well, the best thing for us. And then he mentions, right, that recently, and by this Recently, he's referring to Hardenberg's kind of now top-down program of reform. He says, recently, everything has been coming from the top down. But this is wrong. You know, it has to also, the people have themselves to be organized and so on. Here, 
And so that's one of the possibilities that he's wanting. He says, when you have just a prime ministerial system or a chancellor system, you can get this very bureaucratic, top-down way of looking at things, when in fact, the organization also has to come from below in this case. Okay, so um, I, I'm not sure if I got uh, an answer from you, Terry, on the on the topic that I was trying to point to, but I tell me what I tell me what I didn't say. Well, you I and I'd have to you know I'm gonna what I'm gonna ask is um, this question, which is the, below, which is it, I, I was trying to get to the metaphysical or ontological question, but that was uh, the difference between you and Zizek. Like, okay. Well, um, yeah, so why don't I give Zizek an opportunity to respond, and also I'll, I'll ask uh, Zizek this question I've written down in advance, and then we can come back to the ontology, unless you want to say something now. Very, very quickly, I mean, one of the things that when I've been talking about Hegel in China, right, which is an interesting place because there's an official mm -hmm. communist party running things, mm -hmm. uh, I say, look, you know, there's a lot of people around there who want to be uh, uh, Hegelian Marxists here. I think that's wrong here. Yeah, I'd say you should be a Marxist Hegelian here. That's what I would, that's what I would put the emphasis on this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's a subtle distinction. There's Marxist Hegelians and there's Hegelian Marxists here. I, th mm -hmm. I, I would call myself more of a Marx inspired Hegelian. Okay. And, and you that. <laughs> no, you, that... sorry. Doc, you failed, because again, I agree with you. You put it wonderfully. It's not enough to be a Hegelian Marxist, but Marxist Hegelian, a Hegelian who, from his standpoint, renovates his position, taking into account Marx, later capitalism, and so on. But I know, Doc, what you are aiming at, all that stuff about gaps in reality, negativity. Can I answer now? Yeah, go ahead. As briefly as I am, uh, I am uh, genetically <laughs> able to do. Mm -hmm. First, uh, 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 with this monarch stuff, I totally agree with you. Hegel's point, I think, is not monarch as such. It's just that experts, bureaucratic managers, shouldn't have the entire control. That there should be this minimal gap in the top of power and. He was here today, this is maybe even more actual than ever, when, uh, you know what's happening now, just very briefly, but I followed the situation, it's as it were across the street here, less than one hour driving a fast car in Italy. You know, this Mario Draghi government is something that, which is now in crisis, but you know that it's something very strange. and It's something like, uh, they call it techno-populism. A manager, draggy, banker, blah, blah, presents himself as, I will, somebody who can bring uh, uh, economic theory, uh, uh, who knows what is going to, to, to politics, but in a totally depoliticized way, like addressing all, and he... Up till now, it worked. You know who was the only one in Italy who saved the glory of politics as not reducible to expert knowledge? It's sad to say. The extreme right fascists, they were the only one who stayed out. Let me not lose time. Let's go on. Uh, to, I'm sorry, Doug, to disappoint you, but to supplement that support, what uh, about the future tendencies and so on, what uh, Hegel thought. Would you agree, Terry, that even when Hegel appears to be simply worried about the future, reactionary, he has a deep insight which later we can see is justified. Like, which is the text which is mostly quoted as a proof of Hegel's uh, conservativism. He's, correct me Terry, you know everything at this level if I am wrong, but isn't his last published text his critique of the English reform bill? And it's usually dismissed as Hegel's fear against general elections, no longer this nice corporate system where you participate in universality only based on your concrete particular position in the, the social edifice. But 
If you read closely that text, I did it recently, you discover, I was uh, uh, advised to do this by another uh, Marxist Hegelian, my friend Adrian Johnston, you discover wonderful things. Hegel's uh, idea is that if you just, without changing wider economic relations of power, if you just introduce uh, 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 this uh, voting uh, abstract egalitarianism, that, to put it in today's terms, you no longer get rabble or what we call today lumpen proletariat, you get something that I like to call lumpen bourgeoisie, you know, a vulgar money-grabbing bourgeoisie, and that, again, if certain further social economic changes are not done, then the result of this can be that you have formally free elections, but rich, corrupted elites, lumpen bourgeoisie, uh, uh, manipulates them, and so on and so on. I mean, it's an extremely actual insight. Second, what you said, Terry, it's fascinating. I just want to uh, add something about uh, Marx's maturity later. No? You know what I appreciate most in late Marx? That it's so obvious how he, in the deepest noble Hegelian theoretical sense, how he enjoyed writing Capital, all the slow process. And I don't know if you knew this, Terry. There is around 1870, where there was, of course, for a brief time, an illusion. Oh, it's beginning. After Paris Commune, there will be European Revolution. There is a, a passage for which I still love Marx. He writes with worry to Engels, no, they are doing revolution. My God, I haven't yet finished Capital. <laughs> Finish first my proper work. That's the that's the spirit. But now I go to two more fundamental points. What you said, Terry, about uh, French Revolution and so on. You know what I nonetheless maybe here do we put a different accent or something? Please strike back. Yes, Hegel has this opposition between sudden radical change and this gradual. Uh, growth from beneath of a different order. But, uh, uh, you know, if you read Hegel clearly, nonetheless, for him, French Revolution was a necessary moment. And that's what I appreciate with Hegel. To get at the right final point, you have to go through a radical mistake. You cannot directly go to truth. Here I, politely, we are even some kind of friends, disagree with Judith Butler. I don't know if you know it, Terry, she a year ago or when published a short text on Hegel and tries to draw Hegel's lesson for today, which is we are not isolated beings, we should live in mutual recognition, not only recognizing each other's, but even uh, our environment and so on and so on. No, Hegel's lesson is almost the opposite. Yes, but to arrive at that point, all the nightmare of history is necessary. You cannot, you know, for Hegel, errors are not something that if we were to be bright enough, we would be able to jump over. That's very important today. The last point that you make, and now I will quickly conclude about this uh, nature, gap, negative, and so on, where, if I correctly understand Terry's position, where I deeply, nonetheless, you will not get us to fight so easily that you have to put more... Oh, I, do, I have, though. You're doing it. Go on. No, <laughs> that, uh, you know, some... And now comes a touchy question for you, uh, uh, Terry. Some, uh, how should I call them? I even don't know. Some... Hegelians, who are for me two transcendentalists, in the, for example, again, I appreciate his work, but uh, Robert Pippin says uh, that uh, even if science will totally self objectivize us, there still would be argumentative reasoning, blah, blah, that it, I am 
uh, Hegel would never said it like that. For Hegel, even our highest self-reflection, basic, let's call it transcendental stance, is always mediated by what materially goes on. Sorry, if, let us say, I hope not, but I've written a book on it, Hegel in a Wired Brain, I'm not satisfied with it. But I think the problem I'm touching there is the right one. It's not so much this digital control, blah, blah, everything, but what really I'm afraid of is this possibility, which friends who know it are telling me it's not a bullshit, that somehow uh, they will establish a direct link between the flow of our thoughts and digital processes. Usually, as they always do, today's masters, they present this as something humanitarian, like, you know, a guy who is completely crippled will be able to intervene in the world only through his thoughts. But you know, what goes up out also comes back in. This means they will be able to read. And what will happen to our, let's call it old fashionably human essence, if something like this becomes reality? This is not just an empirical question where we can safely say, oh, it doesn't really matter our transcendental way of thinking described by Hegel in his logic. That is an a priori that will remain the same. I'm not so sure about this. So, yes, what I'm trying to do is uh, precisely uh, uh, as you Doug, wrote in your question, to see a media a mediation there. In the sense of uh, we have to... It's not simply that our thinking is an a priori. We have to raise the question of how, in nature, the way we know it, at least now, something like thinking could take place. This is a serious problem. It shouldn't be dismissed in this arrogant, transcendental way. Okay, so I want to add, a, a, I'm going to dare to add a thought I'm having as I listen to you both. <laughs> Um, which don't, is that... our, don't play with our mercy too much, but okay. okay, for okay now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, you know, under capitalism, uh, I believe that what is mediating our thinking and our social relations is um, the way people produce things and produce commodities. And, and, and um, I think that many Marxists believe that if we could overcome that, we can liberate the working class. We would have a way to be more directly social without a mediating ideology or or aim. And uh, one one of the things I like about Hegel and uh, and Zizek's interpretation of Hegel is that he was answered no. There's a necessity for some sort of mediating con concept. There's a necessity for something that may not, that's ideological or not quite right, that's an error in some way, mm -hmm. in order to create uh, social relations. That doesn't mean it's it, that whatever that thing is has to be uh, permanent and all, for all time. It's not transhistorical, it's historically developed, but the fact of the, the need for mediation and for some organizing principle to uh, arise um, is transhistorical. The, the, that need is transhistorical. So uh, what I'm wondering is, if does that mean that in the natural world there's some uh, gap or some, that we will never be able to understand nature well enough to just directly relate to it social and directly relate to each other because of the being of nature? Or is this just an, uh, something inherent to consciousness, I think? Um, that's that's the, the the question and could we conceive of developing a consciousness a general intellect that could overcome the limitations that we have now um so that's well, you know let me just jump in. the um, question you're asking is really a question of negativity Doug. i mean mm -hmm. uh, you know can we ever become so absorbed in nature maybe through some type of super technology of the future yeah. and so on Right, so absorbed that we just lose this capacity for negativity. But that would mean we'd actually lose the capacity for self-consciousness. We wouldn't. We just yeah, wouldn't yeah. be 
people anymore. Mm. Uh, it's, you know, Hegel's nice phrase that he uses in the phenomenology, right? Is the in self-consciousness, we understand ourselves as different from ourselves, but it's the difference that is no difference. That gap is infinitesimally small, but it's there. And it's that gap at which the point of spontaneity arises. You know, so there's paragraphs five, six, and seven in the introduction to the philosophy of right. Hegel says, you know, paragraph five, right? First of all, there's just the unity of self-consciousness, but that's empty here. Paragraph six, right? It must get its content, therefore, from either nature or spirit. The content has to come from outside itself. That's where mediation now is going to be coming in. And then paragraph seven says, so the, what we're looking for is, you know, some way of do, bringing this all in so that it all kind of fits together perfectly and so on. But five and six are really important there. And so this has to do with what, how you understand negativity. Now, in the past, um, I've, I have taken Slavoj to be claiming that negativity really is something in the world itself apart from our self-conscious engagement with it. And I take Hegel to be claiming that negativity emerges really with self-consciousness. Uh, there's a nice little passage in the history of philosophy where he says, you know, when you have self-consciousness emerging, being for itself, right? He says, there's no new content necessary that arises, but the difference is huge, ungeheuer, right? It's just monstrous. <laughs> and he says, all of world history hangs on that. One of the reasons why you say a vulgar, Mar the vulgar Marxist or the vulgar social historical forces theory of history isn't going to work is that history, history requires this, what Sartre called monstrous spontaneity, the ability to you know, really not fully identify with where you are at that particular instant and so on. How exactly that works out in concrete terms, right? Requires lots of other mediating factors, social institutions and so on and so on here. Um, I don't think this is a transcendental uh, view, right? That we're looking for the conditions of possibility of something. It's rather, uh, you might say, the metaphysics of human subjectivity is such that the negative emerges with us here. And if for whatever reason we vanish, the negative then vanishes too. There are hints of it and intimations of it in ordinary life, but it doesn't really fully emerge until self-conscious beings are on the scene here. So, Zizek, did you want to respond to, to Terry? Yes, but step by step, I will be short nonetheless. First to you, uh, 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 Doc. You know where Hegel would have been actually in analyzing today's situation. What always bothered me with Marx is one thing. If you read closely Capital and other texts, it's strange how when he talks about the future emancipated society, communism, and so on, he, as if he suspends, ignores the dimension of sociality and talks about self-transparent subject who kind of uh, regulates, plans social life. Today, things are getting complex. You know, in what sense? First, you, Doug, I think, said commodity, capitalism, and so on. Yes, but intelligent Marxist and other historians point out that if we are experiencing something in the last decades, it's precisely the key role of what Marx would have called non-valorized work, work which is not formally included in capitalist reproduction, like you are exploited by a capitalist, capitalist takes the profit, and so on. But all the forms of exploitation, where you don't have, in this sense, literal commodity exchange, let's take, maybe I'm wrong, that's what friends from Canada are telling me. In spite of all this, playing a progressive guy, Trudeau in no way limited fracking. But fracking, I was told, is a catastrophe for the area there, which is usually, as a rule, inhabited by indigenous people there. No? And so here we have, and in Ecuador it happens the same, the same we have something we may call ecological exploitation. In technical Marxist sense, nobody is exploiting you. Even sometimes state supports you, like you give some 
some money to, to the natives to survive, whatever. But the point is your natural environment is ruined. The other thing, precarious work, the, dis- the different forms of uh, from women's, all that has to go on, but but uh, to for commodity capitalist reproduction to go on. Second thing that is changing is, as I already mentioned it, the role of precarious work. For me, Uber is an invention of a genius. Look, formally you are not exploited. Mostly they, the capitalist doesn't own means of production. You usually own your own car. You can even choose when you work and so on and so on. And uh, Uber is saying, we are just offering an algorithm to bring customers and drivers and cars together. But if you study it, I did a little bit, you learn the terrifying account of how precisely when you think you are totally free, you are totally controlled. Like uh, uh, Uber collects uh, then the reactions, how, uh, how satisfied are customers, they, you are free to choose when you will work. But if you don't fit the times, if when you want to work is not what Uber wants, you will get downgraded and so on and so on. So I think things are getting here enough complicated that this basic Marxist scheme, capitalist exploitation in the traditional sense, no longer hold in that simple way. Marx, you remember how... Zizek, we'll have to come back and debate political economy if you'll be willing. We'll just have to go no, into... No, 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 no. <laughs> I just want to say that that here Hegel, with his notion of rebel, is important today. Marx was dismissing rebel as trash, usually used by like people like Napoleon III and so on and so on. Now I'm coming to my Last point, the difficult question. I hate you, Doug. You get double the, 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 uh, the uh, re-education camp for asking this. Mm. Maybe there is a difference here, and I will openly confess what is my mega speculation. I totally agree with you, Terry, that projecting some kind of negativity which clearly... Uh, which clearly relates to or uh, involves, uh, I wouldn't even say self-consciousness, but rather self, self-reflection. self Because what I found on, of interest, and Terry, that's a question to you, would you agree? What I found so interesting in psychoanalysis already in Hegel is that what Hegel calls self-consciousness is not necessarily a psychological category of, I am aware of it. For example, in a wonderful passage in, correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, I think philosophy of right, when Hegel makes this bombastic statement of, you know, the state is the self-consciousness of a nation or something like that, population, he gives a wonderful example of state ritual, like a parade or whatever. And he even, my God, I'm so sad, I don't know the quote. He says, it doesn't matter what individuals are thinking there. And this is my evil, male chauvinist, sexist reading. You may be thinking about your next love affair or what. By participating in a ritual, the state gets to, the state uh, acquires some kind of, self-consciousness, which is really self-relation. The same in psychoanalysis. You know this classical example? I want to say something, but I produce a symptom which tells the truth. In some sense, in symptom, symptom is my self-reflection, because in a symptom, I reflectively designate register where I don't agree with myself Where is the split with me? I relate to myself. Okay, that's one point. The last point, to conclude the difficult question, I now make a big confession. But 
when you say Terry, there is no uh, in this sense negativity. I agree in nature, but maybe I'm here pre pre Hegelian primitivist, or maybe even too much under Schelling's influence. You know, my big love is also not the late Schelling, Weltalter, Stuttgarter, Vorlesungen, and so on. I ask, but is really nature at its most fundamental some primitive mechanical process? And I'm not talking here about anthropomorphizing it or whatever. I'm not David Chalmers, who claimed that the only way to get out of this is to attribute to nature itself <coughs> some form of sensitivity, self-awareness. I'm just fascinated by, and I'm talking a lot with them, by quantum physicists who tell me not they don't talk about negativity or whatever, but this idea that when we cannot perfectly understand or measure nature, this doesn't mean, I found wonderfully Hegelian, this Niels Bohr's idea, uh, which incidentally was too much even from Heisenberg. For Heisenberg, indeterminacy, contingency simply meant we cannot measure position and velocity of a particle. Bohr's idea was, no, they themselves don't have this property. And this is what fascinates me. I cannot get rid, I'm sorry, that's my confession, of, of this wonder how nature is not a simple primitive level of mechanical determinacy and things that complicated. There is some kind of gap opening in nature itself like and this seems to me a hegelian move what you think is just your cognitive epistemological limitation is inscribed already in the thing itself now i don't know what to do with this i oscillate here and so on i'm not trying to say oh it's negativity there and so on i'm just i put it in a more modest way i agree with you terry not negativity but nonetheless, that's my gut feeling, maybe I'm secretly a theosophical mystic, that some kind of inconsistency, gap, whatever you do, should be there in nature to make negativity in human sense possible. That's how much I commit myself. Now, I expose myself, Terry, pull behind your kind back, pull your knife out and strike back. So we have a we have like an option here. We're we're at an hour and twelve minutes. Slowly, uh and and uh, Terry yeah, and I okay. agreed before. As far as I'm concerned, we can go for some five ten minutes. It's not a problem. Okay, okay. I so really, ra like to get from Terry back some kind okay. of. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, then definitely, Terry, you should go. But what I want to ask is, if after your your round, if I can ask the question, what is you know what did Hegel mean when he said. Uh, subject, substance, substance, subject. And so, but why don't I let you respond to Savoy first? Okay. Um, I, I mean, I think all this is very interesting. Um, I, you may, it, you may actually be a, maybe a, a kind of a later shelling than even shelling was a later shelling. I've often thought when I, especially when I was reading less than nothing, I imagine that sometime around 1853, somehow or another shelling and Engels and Marx got together and hit it off. And Schelling then said, I've, I've got to change my mind here, right? Now I've got a better idea about where things are going and so on. Wrote a scenario from some TV series. That would be wonderful. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that would be you know, kind of a, it, the meeting that didn't happen, but it could have happened. And you know, Schelling would have then had, I think, probably something like a, the suspicion that there has to be something in nature. And of course, early Schelling, right, with the ideas for a philosophy of nature and the Weltseele and all I that. I hate stuff. that, not identity philosophy. Okay, I not like the... Freiheitsschrift where... Oh, the Freiheitsschrift, the... yes, right. Down. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so that's, yeah, 18, 1809, that kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, I, you know, as I say, the the question still is, uh, is what, what, a neg what negativity in nature. Now, one of the things I think is also true that Hegel... Hegel didn't have this view of nature as this kind of, you know, homogenous medium of everything. Yeah, in yeah, fact, yeah. it was really a kind of, you know, blotchy view that he had of nature. So that, hey, you remember, his rejection of the empiricist account of nature is that empiricists, 
typically like Hume, just simply we describe regularities. All laws are regularities, observe regularities. And they can't explain why these regularities occur, except by citing even further regularities. And of course, what Hegel wanted to say was that that just doesn't show where the explanatory account is located. It's located in the kind of ways in which nature has already organized itself metaphorically. For example, what makes Newtonian physics possible is that there is such a thing as a mechanical system. And that he also, and that, so you have one form of causality, which is mechanical causality, but then you also have chemical causality, which he identifies as being that of a process and its product, where you can't really separate the process from its product or the product from its process that brings it about and so on. So that you get new forms. Now you have chemical causality. You'll also have biological causality, which is going to involve all kinds of ways in which the life process selects species out. And then finally, when you get to Geist, you have uh, the causality of freedom. So you have mechanical, chemical, mm -hmm. biological, and the causality of freedom. And these uh, only really fit together in a kind of speculative way when we look back. Now, nature on its own, though, and this comes back to Doug's question, nature on its own doesn't have this. Nature just is a big blotch of different things. And as Hegel says, it produces all kinds of exceptions to its own rules, right, and so on. And that's why sorry, we need to... Can I ask you an important, sorry to repeat question, how does then fit into this mechanical, uh, organic, blah, blah, because uh, uh, and you have magnetism in between crystals, whatever. I know the complications, but how would, sorry, speculative question, but I love them. How would Hegel react then to quantum causality, quantum physics? Where would he put it here? Yeah, this is a good question. I haven't got a good answer to it. Uh, so I'll just confess that right at the outset. It would be uh, an example of what I, you'd have to put it into some type of mechanical causality because it's not just chemistry and it's not biology yet. And it would be one of the places where mechanical causality, at least in its classic kind of Newtonian sense, where you have you know, rigid rods and strings and all these you know, bigger yeah. balls. Yeah. That just wasn't, wouldn't work here. You'd have something else. And I think he'd probably say this is just, I mean, guessing on my part. All right. He said, this is exactly where we get the transition from mechanical causality to chemical causality. It's just nature mixing it up in all these different ways and probabilistic ways that uh, the Newtonian system, which is perfectly good right, for the, you know, calculating planetary orbits and so on, mm -hmm. uh, but isn't going to work for that kind of thing. But that's, you know, that's kind of just speculation on my part. Okay, but but did had you finished? Because um, he kind of interrupted with that question. Had you gotten to the end of your thought about uh, negativity and freedom and and being contained in the human? Yeah, uh, in a nutshell, right? Negativity is coming about with our conscious self consciousness. If it's the difference, there's no difference. It's that gap we have between ourselves at every given point in time and so on, and that's where negativity enters. And because of that negativity, we are capable of exercising spontaneity. Just yep. doing something new here, right? Non-rule governed and so on. And then trying to find out ways to fill in that spontaneity, right? That's going to say paragraphs five to six in the philosophy of right, right? With either, from either nature or spirit, where you have to start not merely acting spontaneously, but now figuring out how we're going to structure things spontaneously, you know, and so on that preser preserves as much as possible. And that's when you get into the idea of freedom here in the institutionalized freedom and the way we have to learn to kind of be able to live with our commitments and so on and so on. But so that's, you know, that's where that, or that's how, that's how I see negativity. Uh, Schelling in the Freiheit Schrift especially has a deeper you know, ontological view of this. I know that in uh, Less Than Nothing, Slavoj several times uses the Sartrean phrase, there's a hole in being. You know, but Sartre was very clear. The whole in being comes from... You are we, a self-consciousness, yes. You know, well, so I guess I want to ask this question about substance and subject now, yeah. because um, on the one hand, I can I understand and agree with you, Terry, about this um, the, the kind of freedom that, that I'm most interested in, uh, being a human freedom, a, a freedom of the self-consciousness, a subjective freedom. Um, but I also wonder how that freedom could arise, you know, and, and whether, and what's my relationship to the world. So when Hegel says substance and subject, uh, I think he says, in my view, uh, let's see, in which 
which can be justified only by the exposition of the system itself, everything turns on grasping and expressing the true, not only as substance, but equally as subject. What did he mean? I think that's in the preface to the phenomenology. Okay, uh, very quickly, I mean, it's, that phrase has often been repeated completely wrongly. It's, it's, it's often said, you know, it's not substance, the truth isn't substance, it's subject. Right, as if Hegel had this kind of view of cosmic geist and so on being really the... But no, the phrase says it has to equally be one as well as the other here. So the truth is going to be substance. The truth is also going to be subject. And we have to be able to put those two together. And this can only be done through the exposition of the system. Very quickly, what I would say is what Hegel does in his logic is he tries to show how when, after you've developed all the categories of substance and the way it had exercises this kind of reciprocal causation on itself and the way the world is this kind of you know, interacting whole and so on, you still have a way in which substance, you can't express what it is that's going on in those terms. He has a very nice phrase. He says, at this point, what's casting the light, you know, the absolute that's casting the light on all these categories in the logic, you know, which Robert Pippin has called you know, shadows and so on. What's casting the light, substance casting a light on itself is not just substance casting light, it's something else. He says, it's like the light of nature which lights everything up except itself. And it's what is casting the light? Well, it's us thinking about substance, right? So substance, using a Wittgenstein term, substance, substance metaphysics shows itself to us. We can't say what it's about. The negativity of you know, a natural being, a substantial being now turning into a self-conscious being is suddenly the point at which substance now is capable of not merely of showing itself but also saying what all this is about. And that requires now the kind of self-reflexive dialectics that we're going to get in something like the doctrine of the concept in science of logic. All right, Zizek, do you want to take a stab at uh, subject as subject and sub substance as subject? Definitely, but before to Terry, did you notice how he hates me now, Doc? He called me Zizek now, no Slavoj, the first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, let's okay. go on. Uh, it will end bad because, yes, we isolated that small disagreement, but here, again, I have to disagree because, again, Hegel, you put it wonderfully, Terry, Hegel is not saying what we thought is substance big but reality there is really subject some active spiritual agent and so on you know what hegel says in a crucial passage i think in in uh, uh, in in in, uh, in forede to phenomenology i'm getting old uh, you must maybe know it better terry that uh, he subject for hegel it's not just mediation, higher level, subject is also one-sided illusion and so on. The, the passage in phenomenology, which always, again, I always forget, it's not, uh, uh, it's uh, Einleitung, not this, so, yeah, introduction, where he says that uh, not Vernunft, you remember, Terry, uh, this always fascinates me, that Verstand as <laughs> That what uh, uh, brings gap, false, radical distinct, verstand is the greatest power of them all, and so on. This is subject, which means for me, again, as you, uh, Terry said, it's not that substance is subject, which simply means what we think is a chunk of stupid reality, there is a higher power. No, it's that all these ga uh, gaps, illusions, and so on, are parts of substance itself. You cannot understand at least social substance without taking account of this negativity of verstand, which is why, again, Hegel is not simply stupidly what bad Marxists did, oppose verstand as non-dialectical, primitive, versus a more subtle reason or whatever. No. First, uh, you reach the level of reason precisely when you see why verstand is necessary. Verstand precisely in the sense of this crazy power of illusion, as Hegel puts it, separating what is 
organically linked together. Hegel is not this Stalin and others, this thinker of universal interconnectedness. No, Hegel also sees the necessity of partiality, one-sidedness, separation. This is the living force of subjectivity. All right, well, um, we, we've come to an hour and 25 minutes, 10 minutes past where we agreed to go. Uh, I think it was a very uh, interesting and good conversation. I'm going to have to watch it again, take notes, and then see which one of you two will be in Gulag after the revolution. Um, you you mean, we I, poor guy. Uh, well, with me, as, as my roommate. You know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, uh, th thank you both for, for coming, and I hope that I can talk to you both again on, on the podcast in the future. Um, and I would also like to meet you. And you, Terry, where are you? How do vulgar much materially based? I'm materially based, I'm materially based in Washington, D.C. Oh, you are there. Yeah. Right in Georgetown, right, right, no? right, yeah, Georgetown, right. Right in the heart of the I, I only thought, I don't know why, that you are there in California or whatever you know. No. Did you read some wonderful speculation of Chinese guys who want to bring further Hegel's idea of history goes to the West. No? Uh -huh. Their idea is that, that in after Hegel, it went to focus of spirit in United States, first East Coast. Then, do you know about the German immigrant St. Louis, first Hegelian school in oh, yeah. America? Yeah, yeah, I know about that. Said, no, it should move to the middle of United States, St. Louis. Then, California, the miracle... To the uh, to the uh, to the west coast, and now some Chinese saying this is the true Hegelian conclusion of world history. It will jump across Pacific and came back to us, where, according to Hegel, it all began. Yes, I've, I've, I've heard I've heard this line before. Yeah, and did, yeah, yeah. And, and, kind of, uh, it's stupid, and, totally and, irrelevant. <laughs> like yeah. Fine. So you are there. Maybe I can make a jump once or whatever. That would be and great. Can say That'd privately be great. all the dirty things, things about philosophers and so on, you know. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Then and if either of you very are much to both of you. Yeah. And if either of you are ever in Portland, I'll be glad to buy you a coffee Portland. or a beer. Where are you there, Terry? I already told you that. My favorite city, which city in the US has the best bookstore? I think Port maybe Portland. How is it called that one? Powell's, okay, Powell's you books. have in Chicago that seminary co-op, whatever. But I would have chosen Portland, the bookstore there. Yeah, I absolutely. love the city because it's still European, less than half a million people, which means I hate cars. You can cover the downtown walking. Yeah, no, it's just no doubt. This is a fact. I mean, a bare fact doesn't need to be interpreted. It's not. It, yeah. Powell's Books is the best bookstore in the world. Um, thank you both for, for, for coming on. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.